Welcome to Harmony Talk, a podcast about dreamers and doers. Have you ever had a dream? We talk to some very interesting people who have realized their dreams and have a lot to share. And today our guest is Oliver Johnson, an internationally known and self-taught artist, once called a jailhouse artist. Yes, you can imagine why he learned a lot about his work in jail. Now, Oliver's works have been displayed in prestigious art galleries around the world, including the Wildenstein in New York City. And Oliver just learned that his portrait of civil rights activist Vernon Jordan will hang permanently in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Harmony Talk is brought to you by A.M. Skyer, a third-generation family insurance agency founded in 1920. And I'm your host, Lisa Shampo. Welcome, Oliver. Uh, good afternoon. Exciting news about your portrait of Vernon Jordan. It is, Lisa. I was just flipped. I mean, I didn't know what to say. I've been working at least 50 years to have that kind of accolade. I'm just so excited. What do you think it means for your career at this point? I was painting a portrait of uh, Mr. Ken Chenault, uh, the CEO of American Express Corporation. This is just beyond anything I could ever, beyond my dreams. uh, This is definitely my prayers being answered. Well, I know that you have certainly painted still lifes, but portraits really are your genre. I enjoy doing portraits, indeed. Now, you've had a lot of successes in your life, but we are going to look back just a little bit. You kind of ran into trouble as a youth. You were born in Florida, the son of a carpenter and a nurse, but somehow you kind of found your way to the wrong side of the tracks. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, because I think in the end, it kind of influenced where you are today. In Florida, I was a very young boy, but as we moved around from Florida to Maine and then to Baltimore and then to New York and all over New York. Even that in itself, it's I'm always picking up and going. I was just susceptible to, you know, outside influences. Basically, I was a, a really good kid. Went to Catholic school. I did a lot of the right things. It's just that uh, being idle, not having a father, mother's uh, really hustling and doing her degrees and uh, things of that sort. I just got mixed up with wrong crowds. And then when you do go away, you get mixed up. So it's it's easy to be pulled uh, astray, especially in the cities. It was easy for me to lose focus. And so by going to these youth houses and Boys Village and then up into the, the senior prisons, it actually helped me become who I am, because without that, I wouldn't be anything, you know, and also art is not a, you know, you have to have support to answer a dream of any sort in art. When I was in these places, I would always draw and my talent was always there and it always popped up. But only when I was in some sort of uh, reform school or prison or jail, it costs money to acquire these things. And in the prison systems, They always gave it to me and allowed me to do it. There was a time when I was in lower schools and I used to paint the turkeys and the Santa Clauses on these holidays, but it was recognized within me. It's always popped up within me throughout my entire life. So nothing could actually hold it down. It's just that when I did wind up in these particular institutions, they would service me. They would give me the things that I need. The painting materials. Right. It was almost, it's almost like in Buddhism, we call it the Shoten's engines, like Buddhist gods. They're to protect you and to lift you up. Well, one of the prisons you were in, correct me if I'm wrong, was Auburn. Well, it's a maximum security prison, and it's one of the oldest in the state of New York. However, it was a prison for school. So I was sent there because I had the potential to grow up. Because you got to remember, I'm 21. I'm like a, a kid, really, a young adult. And it gave me the opportunity to explore my dreams because they did have a library. They did have a setup, even though it was so old. I was offered to go to Syracuse University on a scholarship. reason I didn't go is because I'm already big into my art by now. We're having art shows in all the penitentiaries that I've ever been in. So the other prisoners also were very respectful and admiring. And also some of them were artists as well. 
So we would get together. And when I left Auburn, I was teaching a class that stayed packed. So they built a new library within the walls. So we would also get, because of the shows that we would have, they singled me out a number of times in the The Buffalo Carrier Express newspaper would come in and interview me. When I left the prison, I went to the state capitol and judged an art show in uh, Senator Ralph Marino's office. It must have been very heady to have had all those accolades in prison. And then you get out of prison and nowhere to live and no real job. And so what happened? What did you do? So once I got out and I got a scholarship to the Art Students League, they said, just pick where you want to go. And the funny thing about it is they'll supply you with paints and brushes. And I would put it in the trunk of the car. Which is where you, where you lived? What I was staying. You know, so that would have never worked. However, I did get very close to my instructor, you know, because I wanted to learn, seriously learn. I would be with my instructor and everywhere he went, you know, like I was even with him, even outside of the school. I got to go to the Metropolitan Museum for the first time. I couldn't believe that a human being could create such beautiful works of art. I went to the Frick Museum. I would, even though I was staying out short periods because I would do so, you know, wind up back in jail. Eventually, you didn't wind up. Right. At the age of about 22, 23, it was all over. So it was almost for me, I look at it as being, that's my degree. That's my university degree. The prison really made it a point in my life that You know, I had to really talk to myself. I mean, are you going to continue to be this kind of a character in the society? Or are you going to really have some guts and go after what you want to do? I remember questioning myself like this. Either you're going to do it or you're not. You're just going to wind up a bum in one of these jails. And I have lots of respect from the inmates Do you still keep in touch with some of those inmates? Well, I kind of lost sight of them because of the Buddhism. I really practice hard. Tell me about Buddhism. How did that come into your life? Yeah, my mother introduced me to it because I was getting ready to tilt over again when I had come out. I was having problems, girl problems too. (laughs) Yeah, I was having problems. So she came to my aid and supported me and she helped me find a nice little room big enough that I could set up my studio. So this was a big move in Brooklyn. And I got there first time I lived in Brooklyn. So, okay, I got there. A lot of beautiful things started happening, but I was still out and about. I went to this place called Brooklyn Restoration, a cultural center. And Jackie Kennedy had did some work there. So they were being funded. They saw my work and they said, we would like to get you a show right away. They did that. And I had a friend that bought a lot of art from me. Channel 5, his name was uh, Bill Jorgensen. He was the Channel 5 news anchor. He bought some work from me while I was in prison. And when I came home, I went up to see him. He sent a crew when they found out that I was going to have this show At Restoration, he sent a a news crew to my house, to my little room, my little studio. Bob O'Brien interviewed me. And when it came on, a person by the name of Teddy Brenner, who was then the president of the Boxing Association at Madison Square Garden, saw it, called me and said that we want to come and see you. So do you know who I am and that kind of stuff? Sounds like this kind of ignited your career in a way. It did because they came in limousines and and it was just a big thing. And I took them up to the Brooklyn Restoration Center. They started buying everything I had. And so I didn't never had that much money. And so I says, well, I got enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Those early paintings, were they portraits? They were like all kind of things that I had experienced. Kids doing what kids do, uh, some portraits, some still lifes. But still in the kind of realism, naturalism category. Well, I practice the old masters. 
So, and that was from years and years and years. So I have all the books and I have the wisdom that they were sharing. You know, that's how I paint. I mean, when I dream of a picture, I dream because of Rembrandt did it or Velasquez did it or Rubens did it. I also learned French and Italian. I started with the Italian masters. It just went full circle. And so like now when I look to do a work of art, what I'll do is I'll go in my files and I'll see what has this related to with the history of art. And so that's how I come up with the style, the technique and who did it where, you know what I mean? Well, that's interesting. Take me now to your portrait of Vernon Jordan using that kind of methodology. With Vernon Jordan's portrait, the photo, it was just not good enough. Now, you've got to remember, a lot of this is just natural instinct. I came out with this beautiful background that even blew me away. I'm a doctor friend of mine says, I like doing using those blues. But he had on a beautiful suit, a pinstripe, a red tie, white shirt. But this blue... Well, I know I've seen a few of your paintings and your use of color and light is splendid. And it does reflect some of the old masters that you mentioned, at least in my humble opinion. Yes. But I'm thinking, you know, this Vernon Jordan and the blues and even the Ken Chenault painting that you did recently, the uh, former head of uh, American Express, also the same light coming through. So how do you pull that out of a person through a photograph? Or- yeah, that's, and that's, uh, even the little short time I stayed over in the Art Students League, they could never believe that because everybody's got to have the life person right there. That's good too. I do that too. Because I practiced so many years in these solitary places, I have some kind of fortune to be able to bring that photo and pull the life out of it through me, no doubt, because I did also meet Ken Chenault and I also met Vernon Jordan and I was there with them, talking with them. And I remember a lot of things, you know, we discussed. What are some of your own personal favorite portraits that you've done? Well, the next one is always the favorite. I got to keep moving. Right. You just got to keep doing it. That's the joy of it all. Staying busy. But there might have been some in your past that you kind of reflect back upon. Well, that Vernon Jordan one and the Chenault, I think it's even more powerful. It's always the new one, you know. You only have so long to hold on to that kind of energy before you got to explode into something else. And right now we're getting ready to do the harmony in the woods. It's going to include the audience, the stage the people that are on the stage, the woods themselves, and the way the stage is built with the lights, it's just unbelievable. I'm really dreaming about this all the time, you know, always trying to figure and get other people's inputs. Now, that will be very different, though, because that's kind of like a, it's a stage, a setting. It's not a portrait, per se. No, no, this is, but I do a lot of things uh, that are not portraits. Like, Kids uh, playing in the street, jumping rope with the girls uh, or the guys doing scully there's games, uh, all kind of ring allevio. You know, I mean, I do I do things that I feel like experience, too. But I do like the character studies. I do like people and in a person, whether they're young or old, there's always some kind of character. I think that if I do a study I will also inherit some of that character. I think that it's a connection of life itself. I mean, I do everything, and I do it because of the life force. It's all about the life force. I used to do a lot of sad children, a lot of older people and things like that. And now I think because as I practice faith and deepen my faith, that I'm coming out with more happy situations, more happy attitudes, smiles, and just people not always so sad and and always bent over, but people who are like full of joy. 
So the Buddhism is really sort of coming to life. And, you know, we all want to see people expressing more joy, especially right now. (laughs) Yes. But, you know, a lot of times you don't even do it. Just like weeds are really cool, too, you know. Everything can be a road. Except in my garden. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I know what you mean. And weeds have a a serious life. I mean, and some weeds uh, people pick as they would pick a rose. True. Very true. Those wildflowers can really be a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Are there any modern portrait artists that you admire or that you, um, you did mention some of the old masters? That works like this. We're all contemporaries if we're living, and we all have to learn to enjoy one another's work, and that's what I do. I really do enjoy my contemporaries. However, I'm not totally an abstract person. However, what we call abstract, coming from the Renaissance, what we call abstract is the design of the, the situation, the design of the situation. Whether you're from Italy, France, Spain, wherever, the design is our abstraction, not so much as if I were going to do a Jackson Pollock. Right. Well, what about somebody like Picasso? Well, Picasso did it all, though. So when he was like 17 and stuff, like I've seen him, the paintings that he did when his father was sick. This guy is, could throw down. I mean, he was really great at his craft. He, that, he was such an innovator. He really pushed the envelope, you know, as time went by. You know, he didn't just sit. And that's another thing that anyone who just uses a recipe or some kind of thing that's always going to get them to from A to B, you know, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about we're talking about people that take chances, people who who really fight for the new flow, the new energy. And is that something that you're doing in your... Oh, no doubt. Yeah. That I, because I don't even know what I did before. There's nothing that I can really do that I've done that I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let me go through that again. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's all about the future. It's all about... Picasso was just uh, fabulous to just put it out in so many... Matisse, all of those guys. They're like... They're modernism but on a different level. And also, they could do things, too. You know, you have to go through the basics, too, at least, before you could start scribbling and stuff. And I think that's probably, if you had a message for young people starting out in painting, that would be something that you would say to them, right? Learn the study, basics. Study now, especially when you're young, because that's when you can let it go. When you get older, you can just free up and just let it flow. That's what we're talking about now. But you always should have the basics locked down. Really practice, practice. It's been said that you're a wonderful draftsman. Oh, yeah. I've been told that, too. So what what's next for you? You mentioned uh, painting, of course, Harmony in the Woods. What else do you see on the horizon? Well, I just got, I got a commission from Vernon Jordan's group of lawyers. They want me to do some work for them. Also, Mr. Chenault's wife. Oh, my goodness. You're going to be very busy. Will you get a chance to go to the National Portrait Gallery and see your work? But, you know, I would take these trips by myself. I actually fly into Washington and just to go to the National Gallery. I try to go to every museum that I can. And so that's what I have planned because it's always good. You know, even though we have books... It's always good to go and see the original. And some of the paintings that I grew up with, when I go back to the museum, you should see how I look at them now. How do you look at them? Tell me. Well, it's like, see, before I would run directly home and try to record what I had just learned. Now, when I see it, I say, wow, you could actually see the artist in the studio doing it. I mean, you could actually see the whole process of building Because you're so much more experienced now yourself. It's so much more because I'm doing the same thing. You must feel closer to them then in a way. Well, I do. I do. You know, hey, Leonardo, I'm here. Uh, Whoa. (laughs) I got to go to Italy for that. But, you know, the funny thing is these museums are really 
having these shows that travel. So they'll put on a Leonardo show. He doesn't have the, the group of artwork that we see in books. I mean, it's only a few things that they did, but, but he was, did so many other things. But they'll put on a show that will move throughout the world. That's wonderful. You, you sound like you have a great white. Well, you're going to be very busy, actually. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us on Harmony Talk. Really appreciate it, Oliver. I wish you the best of luck. And I, I can't wait to see Vernon Jordan's portrait in the National Gallery next time I'm in D.C. Harmony Talk is brought to you by A.M. Skyer, a third-generation family insurance agency founded in 1920. Learn more at amskyer.com. Talk to you next time. <laughs>